Well, hello, sports fans. Greetings and salutations. This is Athletics Chat number 79. Stuart Weir, the charming man in the center of the screen with the earphones on, is in Oxford, England, the intellectual capital of the world. This is Larry Eater. I'm in San Jose, California. The, what do you call it? It used to be the land of all things, uh, uh, you know, veggie and fruity. And now it's, uh, it's kind of Silicon Valley. Um, although I did see the Trans-Siberian Orchestra last week, which was really kind of fun to see. They're not from Trans-Siberia, just so you know. I think they're all from San Diego, Croatia, and the Ukraine. But uh, they were quite uh, entertaining. Stuart, great to see you. Oh. Um, before we get on our list of topics, uh, Ryan Krauser and Molly Seidel won the two big awards at the uh, USATF convention this past weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing is there's a little bit of a, well, several things are going on. One is that uh, Runner's World magazine last week uh, revealed that a grand jury has subpoenaed the tax records uh, and the social media records of USATF including Max Siegel and Renee Washington, um, and also a couple of gentlemen at a group um, that is run by two former Nike employees. This is all about the deal between Nike and USATF. I believe it goes through 2032 or 2042, averages about 19 million a year. And um, there are some questions about it. Where it gets very interesting is that Several years ago, Vin Lanana, the former head coach at University of Oregon, and the man behind the Eugene 2022 bid, was uh, interviewed by a grand jury. And Max Siegel and um, uh, the board um, had him um, kind of put out to pasture um, where he had no say at all. There was a very bitter battle between Lanana and the board. Um, I'm not sure they still play well with each other's. Um, Lanana had to go to the CAS, the uh, the Center for Sports Arbitration in Switzerland, and he was reinstated as president in 2019. And several media groups over here are wondering why Max Siegel and Renee Washington are not put on leave uh, with this situation going on because it, it could cause some issues. Um, so we've got a few things going on in the USATF. On top of that, um, we still haven't had, had an answer from World Athletics or from um, the World Champs in Eugene about how they're going to juggle the $20 million that was, they were supposed to be getting 40 to 50 million from the state of Oregon. And I think they're getting 20 million and um, with ASICS as a sponsor uh, a World Athletics, one wonders, well, where's this money going to come from? Surely ASICS isn't going to come up within the $20 million. Are the other sponsors? What's going to happen? So there's a bit of kind of strange intrigue. One of the things that you and I have been talking about is um, we welcome the new communications director, Jesse uh, uh, Gabriel, uh, who worked in Tracktown, and comes with a wonderful reputation um, Gene Cherry was just saying really nice uh, from Reuters was just saying wonderful things about uh, uh, Jesse. But the issue is, up until this time, there has been a dearth of communication from world the world championships. And um, I sent notes to them personally, asking them about things. We get some every once in a while press releases, uh, which they kind of do as a minimum. Uh, but we also, um, how do you build up a world championship? When do you start? And especially in a pandemic, shouldn't there be discussions going on and things? And we don't see it. And it's in the typical fashion in the U.S. They put on a track meet, and it could be the best organized track meet in the world. And less people show up than should. And that's my beef. Uh, we, we know in every other sport in the U.S., we promote the heck out of them. Mm but not in track and field. And why is that? You know I mean? Steve Miller, who at the time was at Nike back in 1989, 1990, would talk about how we could be seven hours late with a 
track meet and people would put up with it. But if we were five minutes late with an American football game, people would go crazy, you know? So that's our, our stuff today. But let's talk about um, the athlete of the year decisions, my friend. What do you think about that? Well, um, I think it was a phenomenal year. And let's start with the men. I don't think you can say that Carson Warhol didn't deserve to be athlete of the year, um, having uh, won the Olympics, uh, broken the world record. But look at it from Ryan Carson's point of view. Won every meet he was in, won the Olympic gold medal, broke the world record. Um, I mean, there is a tradition in English schools, the teachers who don't know what to say on reports, right, could do better. So I think Ryan Krauser's report is could do better. And then he's thinking, I actually won the Olympics. I won every competition. I broke the world record. So what more do you want from me so that I can become the athlete of the year? That, that's a very tough one. And similarly, look at Mondo de Plantis, who has really made his event so exciting throughout, again, uh, you know, winning the Diamond League, winning the Olympics, uh, and if you look at something else, he also won the European Indoor. So again, he might be thinking, well, what more have I got to do? And then there's our friend, uh, Elliot Kipchoge, didn't have a bad year, or uh, Katiga. But, I mean, I think that if any of those had been awarded, you could argue for them. It just seems to be the year in which there were so many fantastic, amazing performances. You know, I would say you can't disagree with Warhol, but equally you could make a case for any of the other uh, four that I've mentioned who were nominated alongside him. I mean, who would you have gone for? You know, that's, I, I, I have to agree with every one that you've said. Um, I have to say it should have been a tie between Karsten and Ryan. Um, and, and my feeling is that Ryan had a simply perfect year. Um, he has brought back, the, the whole group of throwers are, are really uh, powerful personalities. Um, Ryan stands above them, but they pale in comparison to the characters in the men's pole vault and that whole crew there. And so I would have gone Karsten, Ryan, Mondo, Elliot. And not to say Elliot isn't fantastic, um, but the thing about it is, like you said, we've had a fantastic year. The other thing to note, and one of the things that warms the cockles of my heart, is it wasn't that many years ago that we were really concerned about European athletics and the athletes coming out of Europe. And were you, you were having the same problem that we were having in the U.S. in that the top athletes um, – the top physically talented athletes were not going into track and field in the U.S. The same thing was happening in Europe. Um, I believe in the U.K., one of the phenomenon is that in your multi-events, the top athletes, the Jesse Ennis's, the, the Katrina Johnson Thompson, Morgan Lake. I still think Morgan Lake is going to, you know, do a, a, a fantastic one. Um, your, your top athletes are going to multi-events. Um, and, and in Europe, you know, you've got everything in, in Norway from Warholm and Ing the Ingebrigtsen, you know, group to, uh, and Demando de Pontus in Sweden. And you've got Marcel, uh, um, y Jacobs in Italy. One little bit about Marcel. I don't know if you heard about this. His coach put out on Instagram that Marcel was looking for a training partner. 377 different athletes wrote in and said, we'd love to work out with you. So, you know, um, it's, it's, it's been an exciting year. If you would have told me in January 
that um, Karsten Warholm would have uh, broken the world record, you know, twice in the 400 hurdles. Rye Benjamin would have run as fast as he did. If you would have told me that an Italian would have won the men's hundred and then the relay team, you know, and we never gave that relay team enough credit. And, and one of the things that you and I talk about is the whole idea in a relay is to keep from having crises in the uh, exchange zones. And the four by 100 is like watching is our version of NASCAR. And, you know, it, it, it could be a train wreck, but it's not. And what they happened in Italy, the sprint coach there, oh my gosh, they actually practice. And these kids have run together since, you know, they were 16 years old in some cases. So it's, it's a fascinating thing, but you know, I run off, but, but getting back to it, I think Karsten was a great pick. I also think there's an argument for Ryan and, and, and they, they, Mondo, Mondo is in danger of making the pole vault look too easy and it's not. And what that man did, um, and he's 10 years from being in his prime, what he's getting better and better each year. And the guys like Renault, the guys like Sam Kendricks, uh, Casey Lightfoot, you know, um, Piotr Lysik, uh, the German jumpers, they all contribute, you know, and they get along, but they make the event better. And, and that's what we're seeing, too. I mean, it, we've got a couple wonderful generations of athletes right now. Um, and I think we're in incredible shape in, ter- in the athlete department until about 2036. My concern is with how the federations do things, you know, so. Just one last word on Ryan before we leave this. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking to him about two weeks ago, and I said, not for coming to you. But uh, I asked him what was bigger for him, being Olympic champion or world record holder. And he made a really interesting point. He said, you know, the, the world record has lasted for 30 years. You go back 30 years and you get seven Olympic champions in that time. The only one world record holder. And so he said, when you say how big is breaking the world record, it depends on the record. And the fact that he had broken a record that had stood for 30 years, he felt that that made it bigger than, than the Olympics. I thought that was a really interesting analysis. No, I like that very, very much. Now, Ryan is very thoughtful. He's a lot of fun to talk to about his event. Um, he really enjoys it. He's a great champion for the sport. Um, I'd like to go fishing with him sometime too. So, you know, I'm going to put that one out there. Um, what about our female athletes of the year? What'd you think there? Well, again, uh, it's hard to argue that Elaine Thompson here uh, winning the Olympic 100 and 200 plus playing a part in the Jamaican relay team to go away with three gold medals is phenomenal. But then, you know, Sikhan Hassan uh, winning the Olympics in two events as well, breaking the world record in the 10,000, um, getting a bronze medal in the 1500, so three Olympic medals in different events. Chris Kikiegan um, winning the 1500, and frankly, some people think that if the scheduling had allowed it, she could have come very close to winning the 800, if not winning it. Um, I mean, Sydney McLaughlin um, setting two world records, winning the Olympics, breaking the world record there. And then, um, you know, just popping over to run the relay and running that. And then, uh, you know, Rojas won everything in sight. Uh, world record again. And, I mean, in some ways, perhaps she suffers from not having the competition uh, in, in the way that some of the others have. Like, I mean, Facebook Yeager was brilliant. But going into that race, it was, was possible for her not to win it. 
Um, and, and there's something about Elaine Thompson that I, I, this may be a little controversial, but I was very disappointed with her in the Diamond League final when she just went straight through the mix zone, wouldn't speak to anyone. And actually one of the staff saw this and said, I'll go and bring her back for you. And she wouldn't come. You know, I I think that if you have just won at $25,000 plus whatever your sponsor is giving you for winning that race, you have an obligation. And really, it's not a great sacrifice to give up a quarter of an hour of your time. I mean, ironically, at the time when she was doing that, Jakob Ingebrigtsen was spending 15 minutes doing interviews in Norwegian. And then when he came to, down the line to me, was willing to stand and answer as many questions as I wanted. And that, to me, was sad to see Elaine uh, not recognising her obligations and not being willing uh, to put in the time, remembering that she just had a pretty big payday. I agree with you. I think that sometimes, however, extenuating circumstances, we don't know if someone said something to her or what the issue was, but I still think what you're saying makes complete sense. Um, and I think that if you want the sport to grow, and, and um, Elaine, as you and I both know, has been wonderful in, in, in interviews before. Um, so one wonders why at the, the second biggest showcase of the year that she didn't make herself available. Uh, and that is disappointing. Uh, and, you know, our, our friend, uh, uh, Jacob Ingebrigtsen, um, should get a tip of the hat because he, he always does that. I mean, I remember, I, I remember being in Dusseldorf in 19 and getting him, then his, um, brother, and then hanging out with his dad, Gert at the bar while his, he was putting down their workouts for the week, you know, and chatting. I remember prop two, three years ago, uh, the Ingebrigtsons were do, to do a press conference in Stockholm. And then it was announced that they had been delayed and wouldn't get there until nine o'clock in the evening. But they would still talk to people. I mean, my answer reaction as well, I bet they just going to come in and do five minutes and go. But... Jakob stayed and talked. I was probably the eighth person in the line. And he spoke to me as if I was the only person in the world who'd ever asked him the same question. And, you know, just a great performance. I just thought, well done you. No, he's a, he's a good he's a good young man. You know, I call him a good kid. Don't want to belittle the, the but I call anybody under, under 40 a kid. So, um, the, um, you know, I, I think that I wanted to take a point with um, one of the things you were saying about the women. Um, I think Elaine was a very good choice. I also think that Sifan and Yulimar a lot of times don't get the respect they deserve. Um, I was there in Monaco when uh, Tiranish to Baba blasted the world record in the 1500. And I watched Sifan, uh, and I believe she was speaking French to a couple of her team. She was in tears. And she made the comment, something to the effect, how could she have beat me by five seconds? And it was at that, right after that, um, she started working with uh, the folks in Portland, including our friend Pete Julian. And it was the little things. And in Tokyo, yeah, of course, the golds and the five and the 10 impressed. But what really impressed me was that last 300 when she fell in the 1500 heat. And, you know, she just dropped a 42 second uh, 300. And, and you knew. She was on a mission. Um, Yulamar, I think, could win the long jump and the triple jump. I'd love to see her. I think for people to take her seriously, it's going to be her and Malika Mihambo 
you know, um, and that could be a fascinating, and that's the Brume and, you know, some of the others, um, that could be a fascinating long jump. Um, unfortunately, some of the Eastern European athletes were just not, they're just not at that level anymore. They can't challenge Ulmar. And, um, you know, in, in, until we get another great jumper from Kazakhstan or, you know, Uzbekistan or, or from, uh, or, or from Belarus or something, uh, our, you know, one of the American women really put it together because they're close, but they haven't got the cigar yet, you know, um, but she needs competition. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Mahambu. Um, I mean, this sounds a bit, uh, um, like, a bit like a broken record to you, but I spoke to her last week. And I was really fascinated to, to see what a difficult year she's had. And, you know, that uh, she didn't win the European indoors. She then struggled. She couldn't get her run up. She couldn't get her rhythm. Um, she wasn't at all confident in the Olympics. Just said, well, look, I just got to make the best of it. So just the last jump the only seven meter jump of the competition to win the Olympic gold then immediately got injured with hindsight she told me she should probably have closed down but she decided she was going to do the diamond league um final uh and she came fifth there which um she said to me that wasn't a defeat for me because i did the best i could given how little training i had and all the problems I had. And again, in a way, I almost admired her for turning up, competing, and and losing, and leaving people who don't know thinking, God, if you've lost it, what on earth wrong with her? But actually, just when you hear the struggles and challenges she's had. You know, I think she's a very, uh, I think, as you said about the men, we had an exceptional year, and a year in the second the second year of the modern plague, you know, the, the pandemic and meets were able to be held. Um, an Olympics was held and, you know, the Tokyo, you were there, the, the LOC needs to be given credit. Um, totally, totally. And, and it's, 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 um, it, it was pretty amazing. And we're heading back into a winter now where we've got a new, variant and people are concerned and we're trying to figure that out um and you've you've also now got um what's really been exciting over the last you know 10 days uh cherry alexander's back at british athletics and we're going to have some meets in the uk i think before we leave can we go to Lika, can i just run through some of the other awards which i thought were interesting um now, I'm always nervous to how she pronounces the first name, but Ati Mu, getting the, the rising female star with her amazing... I mean, how can you call somebody who wins the Olympics in 155 a rising star, but when you see just a female girl? Um, uh, Arian Knighton, the 17-year-old sprinter. The Inspiration Award going to Barsham and Tom Berry. I mean, I think everyone was pleased with that. Uh, and then the Coaching Achievement Award to Bobby Kersey. Um, I mean, I don't think that this podcast is long enough for, for us to list all the athletes who has coached the medals. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, he, he has um, been around for a long, long time. Um, He's been uh, Allison Felix's long time coach and um, he is uh, helping with, um, is he working with Sydney now? Yes. Yeah. And so, and that's his, in, 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 the event she does is his dream event, the 400 meter hurdles. Cause I used to tease poor Allison. Every time I interview her, I ask him when she's going to do the 400 hurdles and she just looks and starts laughing she goes, you know, he's going to have me do it one of these days. So I want to see her do it before the end of her career, because I think she could go out there and run a 52, no problem. But a 52 is kind of like oh, now, you know, um, the. Um, no, I, I think that they did a great job with the with the awards. 
My thing about it was, um, and I'm going to sit back and watch the whole program. Um, it didn't have the fanfare. And I, I, I understand with the pandemic, they've got to really control things. Um, and I, I, I thought the, the, the broadcast stuff was, was fun. Jasmine and, and Paula are, are lovely. Um, and, and with everything being virtual, you know, I think that's the way, unfortunately, it's got to go. So. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Terry being back. And I, I can't think of any story in Breaking Cast Ethics that has produced more um, pleasure. And, you know, the way when you have two, a two-party political system, and when, when the ruling party gets voted out, and the first thing that the new incoming party does is to repeal all the controversial legislation of, of the predecessor. And it's almost like we're watching that happening in British athletics at the moment. You know, um, Joe Cook's era, events aren't that important. Uh, let's get rid of people like uh, Gary Alexander. Uh, let's have a performance director who knows nothing about track and field. And suddenly we see um, the job description for the performance director saying it has to be someone from track and field. We see a non track and field CEO on an interim basis being replaced by a man of the sport. We see Terry Alexander being brought back. And uh, we see um, a commitment from Mark Munro, the interim CEO, uh, to having events and actually saying he wants five elite events in Britain. So I think this is these are great times. And and uh, I mean all of those are quite good guys. But tomorrow Mark Munro gets to meet me. Wow, he is such a lucky man. Tomorrow, if tomorrow there's a there's a, a a Christmas drink with the hierarchy of British athletics. So you get to have a drink, a Christmas drink with Mr. Monroe. That's pretty awesome. I believe so. Well, I've asked him about doing a Zoom interview, and he uh, about a month ago he asked me to get his for me to let him get his feet wet, and then we would chat. Mm. So I'm going to reach out to him this next week or so. And see yeah, what we can right, do there. If, I, if it's appropriate, I'll try and remind you. All right, good. Um, in the U.S., we do letter grades. I'm not sure how you guys do it over there. A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, the previous administration with British Athletics, where would you have given them a grade? That's a hard one because, I, as I wrote recently for you, uh, I don't think it's true that Jill Coach was all bad. Uh, she did some excellent things. I think that her view that it was an advantage that she didn't know the sport, I think that was an error of judgment. I think bringing in um, Sarah Symington, who had no understanding of the sport, was a massive error of judgment. Uh, I think a lot of people might say that was one of the other appointments. Uh, so I don't think overall, I think it's more than a C. Okay, okay. How would you give so far one month into it the new leaders of the of athletics? I think I mean I think totally positive towards them in all sorts of ways, but they haven't actually delivered anything yet. So I, I'm not sure that you can actually really, really reach them. Um I mean it's I mean you Coming up, we've got um, a meet in Manchester, an indoor meet in Manchester in January. Then in Glasgow, there's an intriguing sounding meet called DNA, Dynamic New Athletics, innovative team based competition concept for athletics created by European athletics. It will have mixed gender teams, a compact program, head to head competition. Uh, team match results remaining open and unpredictable until uh, the final competition discipline. 
and uh, certainly already Laura Muir is um, is running on that. So I mean that's interesting. And then we got the normal British uh, Indoor Grand Prix, which is in Birmingham, followed by the uh, British Championship the following weekend. Uh, and then, of course, leading into the world indoors, we've now definitely got, as far as we can see, a Diamond League, um, which is going to be in Birmingham. Uh, sadly, no anniversary games this year, but that's, that's a timing issue. It's because the Americans decided to have the World Championship in July, which is the only time it's possible to do the anniversary games. So they were not going to be anniversary games this year, but we're told that definitely in the next two years already a commitment to have the anniversary games back in London. Uh, so, I mean, I, I have nothing negative at all to say about Ian Beatty or Mark Munro, but it's hard to mark them at the moment because they've got great ideas and great plans, but, you know, um, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as we say. Uh, I will take this point to, and I kind of set you up on the whole British athletics thing. Um, with USATF, if I was doing the same thing right now, I would give a B minus. And I think I'm being very generous. Um, and here's my beef. Uh, for some years now, USATF has made it a little more difficult, actually much more difficult, to find out what's really going on within their organization for the media. Um, they no longer send press release out to uh, known members of the media who are supporting their, their federation every day. Uh, we have to chase stuff down. Uh, uh, I will pat them on the back for allowing me to interview Max Siegel last year, which was a, a wonderful interview and Max was very forthcoming. Um, I, I caution them right now to be transparent as they legally can and explain when they can't about this grand jury situation, because if they don't control it, outside forces will control it, and it'll be bad for the sport. And that's my caution. I mean, Max is, is loved by a lot of people because he brought in the cash. He brought Nike, the Nike deal together. And I know for a fact in talking to people within the Nike organization that Max is highly regarded by uh, that organization. He was during the negotiation. So he's he knows how to do those things. Um, he doesn't seem as comfortable talking with the group. Understand that. Um, and this, uh, uh, the national meeting is always paid in place, man. I mean, I, it, it, uh, I, I don't know if you've been to them in, in British athletics, they have anything similar, but this is four days of politicking and drinking and, and you know, a back slapping and stuff like that. But there's always complaints uh, within a big organization. You're never going to do it right. And there's some things I think USATF is doing right, but there's things I caution them about. Uh, this next year is a pivotal year. Eugene needs to be successful, um, and we need to be able to build into 2028. And and as you've said, the proof's in the pudding, and uh, we've got to say that over here too. Uh, talk to me about how COVID's affecting sports in the UK right now. Um, are, are you guys having any more issues, or is it kind of uh, – I'm, I'm trying to get my updates. I read The Guardian every day, the U.S. version and the U.K. version. And I know they, they go after uh, your charming prime minister um, every day, uh, but it seems that you guys have things under in pretty good shape over there right now. Am I misinterpreting? In terms of vaccination, yes, because we, we've got 20 million out of 60 million and we've had the third vaccination already. Uh, we're something towards 90% uh, vaccinated uh, oh, uh, not without the third one. But no one is quite sure how this um, 
uh, Omicron or Omicron, since we're not terribly clear how to pronounce it, variant is going to affect things. And um, certainly at this moment in time, I know more people who've got COVID at the moment than at any other time. Really? Wow. Um, and they've now, the government has now introduced, and I think they're right, um, travel restrictions that uh, previously we had no travel restrictions, but now we're in a situation if you, if I go to, let's say, France, I have to do two tests, one 48 hours before traveling home and another one 48 hours after arriving. So that uh, is very unpopular among the travel industry, saying it's putting people off. Um, there are mixed messages as to what one should do in terms of um, uh, socializing, business, and so on, with the scientists generally saying, you know, just be cautious, and the government saying, go ahead and have your Christmas parties and see your family and friends. Um, and but in terms of sport, I mean, our big sport is Premier League soccer, and Manchester United are playing in front of 75,000 capacity crowds. Uh, you know, that's happening again. Um, we went through a period when wearing masks in stores was optional. That is if not quite compulsory, it's certainly very he heavily encouraged. And similarly on transport. Um, so it's, it's a time where we're just waiting to see what it's going to be like. And um, I mean, I had hoped that I would travel fully next year, but then I think now I have to think about um, managing the risks. What, what are the risks? We don't quite know yet. Um, some people are saying that the new Omicron variant is going to be the dominant variant within, within a month. Um, and people don't know yet whether it's more infectious, whether it's going to have more uh, deeper effects on people. And so those things in the way have to be, have to be worked out. Um, I mean, certainly things where you used to be able to do without masks, you're now being encouraged again to, to wear masks. Interestingly, my church has never stopped wearing masks. And so that's, but I know that some of have, and are now finding that they're really having to reintroduce it. So basically, if you're in a crowded situation, um, uh, masks are worn. I mean, I have not been to a restaurant where I live for more than a year. Um, that's just something that I'm choosing not to do, thinking it's at their risk to do that. I don't need to do it at the moment. So it, that's a bit of a vague answer, but nothing is very clear at the moment. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering because, you know, I'm hoping to go to the um, Milrose Games and the New Balance meet on the East Coast and possibly the Muscat Marathon in Oman and then head over to the world indoors in Belgrade. And uh, we'll see if, if it's going to be, a, and, and you know, what circuitous route I have to take to get to Oman. Um, my, my belief is, is I'm gonna have to find a direct, you know, a, a, a something leasing to Qatar, but uh, we will have to see how, how it goes. Um, what do you think about any thoughts on the world indoor? I mean, I, I'm very, it's an, the World Indoors is an event that I really like. I've been to everyone since 2012. Um, I think that the Belgrade venue is magnificent. Um, the media seats were pretty small and people were pretty close together, but uh, you get a great view. I mean, I was in, in um Proud for the European indoor the previous year, and the viewing for the media was very poor. So uh, I think that um, this is uh, the potential to be a great event. Um, 
I, I hope they're not using the same starting equipment as they used at the European when we had all these uh, false starts. And now I was told, but I cannot prove it, that at one event, a blank lane false started, according to the equipment. So um, I think it's going to be a great event. And um, it'll be interesting to see, in terms of athletes from Britain, uh, how many people are going to try and do four championships, you know, a world indoors, a world outdoors, a commonwealth and a European. Um, but uh, I think it's with great potential and I'm really looking forward to it. What do you think about, uh, you, we just found out this morning about information on the uh, credentialing process um, uh, for Eugene. And you're talking about the rooms being rather expensive. Um, and uh, just so people know that most of the time when we go to a world or indoor championships or a European championship, um, media, they, they find rooms for the media somewhere around $120 or less, which has really been helpful for the last 30 years. This may be the most expensive since Atlanta. I mean, Atlanta, I paid $400 a night for a Howard Johnson, which uh, would be, if kids don't know who that is, uh, it would be the equivalent of your um, um, uh, chain, the Ebis, uh, business, Ebis business. It's a modest hotel. And they may have a restaurant in there, which I think when I stayed in um, Dusseldorf, I was at the Ebis uh, budget for about 49 euros a night. So about 60 bucks US a night. Um, but this is going to be over 200. Uh, the only inexpensive one is the um, the dorms, which we've stayed at since 2008, and we we were probably going to look into that again. But um, the 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 positive is that we're planning for these events. They look like they're going to happen. Um, a lot of people, you know, we it's nice to see more and more people getting vaccinated and getting the boosters and taking care of themselves and simply wearing a mask and washing your hands, you know, um, th those things not only keep down the pandemic, but they keep down the flu and other, you know, maladies. So we've got to stay with that. But um, Stuart, it was uh, lovely chatting with you this week. And uh, I wondered if you, um, any more, no golf this week, is that correct? It's a bit cold. Um, walking soccer, but no golf. Talk to me about walking soccer for a minute. I'm just curious about that. You have a good time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's big. I play, I'm currently playing three times a week. Uh, it tends to be people sort of 55 and upwards. And it's just like the normal game. It's if you walk instead of running. Okay. All right. Hey, I, you know what? They figured a way to keep people involved, and I think that's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on that note, dear friend, have a great week. Uh, we'll be posting you. your stories. This is yeah. Athletics Chat 79. Thanks to Mike Deering in Indianapolis, Indiana, who's so patient with us, especially me. And uh, stay safe, our friends. Okay. Thank you. Hey, sports fans. Larry Eater, Run Blog Run. This is the epilogue for Athletics Chat 79. Stewart's in Oxford, England. That's Stuart Weir. He's our European editor. And this is Larry Eater. He is, uh, I am, in San Jose, California. Uh, was a couple weeks ago in Hillsboro, Oregon, uh, where we were recording things. But, uh, and then we'll be back in lovely Wisconsin uh, within about two weeks. So we're going to be staying there for the winter. Um, in between some track meets. But uh, Stuart and I had a nice chat today. Talk about the athlete of the year decisions. Karsten Warholm on uh, the men's side and Elaine Thompson Hurrah on the women's side. Um, we both agreed that it was difficult decisions. On the men's side, you had Karsten Warholm, who I thought should have tied with Ryan Krauser. Uh, but I have to admit, Karsten really took the sport by storm. He's quite entertaining. 
Ryan's a little quieter, but world records, indoor and out shot, but records that lasted for over 30, in one case, 32 years. Um, and he won all his competitions. Um, on the women's side, uh, Elaine Thompson won the 100 and the 200 uh, in Tokyo and the was on the, in the four by one uh, winning team. And um, you had Stefan Hassan, third in the 1500, uh, golds in the five and the 10. And the truth is I was most impressed with Stefan when she fell in the 1500 heat, got up and competed fiercely. And that's what it's about in the sport. And there was other great candidates on both the men and women's side. On the men's side, Elliot Kipchoge. On the women's side, Yuli Mar Rojas, Cindy McMaughlin. Um, so there was just some really fantastic athletes. And observations such as, you know, Mondo de Pontes on the men's side makes the pole vault look deceptively easy. On the women's side, Yuli Mar Rojas does the same thing with the triple jump. And Safan Hassan has, suffice to say, done that uh, demystified distance running. Um, I think that we're back to the place where the finest athletes in all of sports are competing in track and field again. Um, we had this weird thing in the 70s, in the 80s and 90s in the U.S., where a lot of the top athletes, just natural talents, um, stopped coming to track and field. They were going to baseball, basketball, soccer, football, American football, make some money, right? Um, the Bob Mathiases of the world, the Rayford Johnsons of the world, the, the Jackie Joyner Kersey's of the world were not coming into American track and field. Can't say that anymore. We're getting the best of the best. You look at the Rye Benjamins, you look at uh, Michael Norman, you look at uh, Fred Curley. My God, would anybody have thought Fred dropping from the 400 to the 100 and 200 would, would just shake things up so much? Look at Noah Lyles. Look at um, Cindy McLaughlin. You know, uh, Cindy is in Delilah Muhammad, two of the most talented athletes in any sports situation are in the same event, the 400 meter hurdles. And the four by four, too, when you think about it, right? That women's four by four, US women's four by four, really going to have to screw up to lose. Um, and looking forward to see who they bring in as a relay coach in the US, too. But um, just the quality of the athletes is fantastic. So we'll give that. Meets in the UK are very happy to see that uh, Mark Monroe uh, wants five big uh, international global meets in. Uh, UK, and I'm looking forward to going to those things. Uh, COVID updates. Mike, over here, we're all a little trepidatious about what's coming this winter with the Omicron. Um, I kind of think we're going to all get stuck somewhere. And so just make sure you get your boosters. Make sure you get everything. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Do the smart stuff. Um, get some provisions put in there because... People get anxious and, you know, you just don't need that. Um, and that's how I'm juggling. You know, I want to go to uh, New Balance Indoor and I want to go to the Milrose Games and I would like to go to the Muscat Marathon and then uh, head over to the World uh, Indoor in Belgrade. And then obviously um, Hayward for Hayward Field for U.S. Champs and for the uh, Prefontaine and for uh, World Champs. And I'm also thinking about trying to hit Doha and uh, a couple of the other meets uh, early on in the season to kind of get a feel for where stuff's going. So let's keep our fingers crossed, hope that things continue to go, that people uh, get vaccinated, that people take the boosters, that people wear masks when they're supposed to, and keep up the important, just the simpleness of washing hands uh, keeps germs from spreading. And I think those are things that are uh, commonsensical and we've got to use common sense. Just keep it out of the political arena because uh, the level of, of BS and the v vitriol on both sides is to me astounding. Um, and this isn't about Republicans or Democrats. This is about survival and um we need people to stay smart. It's okay to be smart. 
We need leaders that are smart too. Okay, World Indoors, that's going to be in Belgrade. That should be a lot of fun. Uh, that's middle of March. And the World Outdoors in Eugene, Oregon. We'll get you updated on those uh, next week. Okay, this is the Athletics Chat 79 epilogue. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe. Talk to you next week.